What's up, everyone? My name is Lauren Wilson. I am an Arizona School of Ministry pastoral student. I am in year two of three. I am taking my ministry courses through Urban Hope Church up in Flagstaff. And I just wanted to share my testimony today. And then my goal for the channel is to have constructive conversations around Scripture and to share stories and to hear stories and to maximize what I what Galatians refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, or, or discipline. I believe that no matter what your worldview is, trying to live your life in such a way where you reap more fruit of the Spirit and you move away from emotions such as anger, bitterness, hate, resentfulness, wrath, slander, gossip. I believe if you move away towards those emotions and towards the fruit of the Spirit, despite life's inevitable pains and sufferings and chaos and confusion, I believe that that, that is a worthy pursuit in this life. And so that's the goal of this channel is to is to again just have constructive conversations. I don't want to force anyone to to believe something or to value something if they don't truly feel that way in their heart. That's not the goal of this. It's to love and it's to have constructive conversations around just how do we live this life to maximize our well-being across people across Time And so my testimony for you guys, so I've always believed in God. However, I wasn't always a follower of Christ. I have two military parents, career military parents. I grew up in a small country Texas town called Bernie, Texas, right outside of San Antonio. In public schools in Bernie, Texas, you have moments of silence for prayer. We said the Pledge of Allegiance before every sporting event growing up we would pray together as a team and so that's kind of what I knew and then being a distance runner running my entire life from a young age I always felt that there was a transcendent power and I called that transcendent power God and I had a relationship with God as any child and teenager would I would pray I would try to listen, I would try to hang out, and I could just feel something. And especially when I would pray before sporting events or give gratitude for the sacrifices that soldiers made or gratitude for food or gratitude for water and shelter, I felt a tangible difference, positive difference in my well-being. However, my parents, we would try to go to church, but we would always kind of go away. I always thought the stories were super weird. None of it really made sense. The story of Jesus didn't really make any sense to my child brain. None of it, just to be honest, none of it made sense. I was also a very prideful person. Uh, I would go to church and I would say, like, I don't need this. Like, who is this guy preaching to me? Who are these other people preaching to me? Like, I don't need this. And now that I've gotten older and I've gotten baptized and become a follower of Christ, I've realized that my journey isn't that different than a lot of other people. And, and what we tend to call it now in church is the de-churched, the unchurched, and those that have suffered church hurt. According to statistics that I've seen, less than 2% of the global population actually identifies as an atheist which means they don't believe in a transcendent being or transcendent power necessarily that is orchestrating things or creating things. So that means 98% of people believe in some sort of deity or God, or as one of my good friends likes to call it, who is an atheist, by the way, the sky wizards, right? The different sky wizards. And but a lot of people don't want to go to church in the traditional setting. And, and when I listen to these people, and I can relate with this as well, is they feel judged 
first and foremost. They feel that there's a, a holier than thou and that people hide behind the church and they're not open, they're not honest, and they're not transparent about the things that they're struggling with. Second is is tithing. There's a huge pressure to tithe. There's a huge pressure to go to church, and if you don't, you're judged. And I want to talk about both of those things in a later episode, but I'm just kind of saying reasons that people don't go to church and the, and the motivation behind this channel. And I guess I'll address it, two of those now. One, if you don't go to church, the New Testament doesn't say that we're supposed to go to church. It says the exact opposite, actually. Jesus goes into the temple and he flips the table and says, Oh, house of, uh, don't change my house of prayer into a den of robbers referring to people using the church to make a profit. And then it goes on to say, and I don't have the scripture right in front of me. That's going to be for another episode. This is just raw testimony. It says that we are the temple, that our body is the temple, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And God also says that his temple, his dwelling place, could not be built by man. And it's like, well, you think about it for a second. No, duh. How arrogant could we be to believe that we could build something for the all-powerful, all-on-the-present, infinite God and creator that is worthy of his dwelling place? Only he could build it, and he created us, and then we are the temple. With regards to tithing, there's nothing in the New Testament that says you must donate 10% of your wages to the church. In fact, Apostle Paul in Thessalonians says, I will work as to not burden you so that I will preach the gospel. He says that I will work and pay for my own bills as to not burden you so that you can focus completely on the gospel. What Jesus says is that by following him, you will more naturally have an open, generous heart. And that means that I'm you're giving your funds however you feel fit naturally to whoever you trust to use those funds as a good steward you will naturally just start to do that as you follow christ and as you practice what christ calls us to practice so that's my motivation behind the channel but back to my testimony so again grew up in texas had a relationship in a way would pray before before all sporting events would pray in school would pray with my family pray with my friends pray with my teammates then I got a scholarship to run track at the University of Texas at Austin. And while I was in Austin, I started to run into my first real adult problems. I wasn't really good in school, didn't see the point, didn't really care, um, was having just lots of anger issues, was having a lot of confidence issues, was having relationship issues, was having family issues. And I would just look up at God and I say, yo, where are you? Where are you, God? Why aren't you doing anything about this? And I was like, if you're not going to do anything, man, like you can just sit there and you can just watch because I'm going to take the reins and I'm going to do it. And it feels silly saying it now, but I've told this story enough times where it's just like, that's just a part of it. That's just a part of my story. And now I realize that that was pride and that pride is a mask for fear. And I was a fearful, fearful undergrad. And so that's kind of where it was. I would just go on my way, and I would just do things my way. And, and to keep it short, I would have really high highs and really low lows. I didn't have a lot of peace in my heart. From the outside looking in, I was doing well. Had my college degree. I started a small business a small fitness business on site for, for teachers and for TxDOT employees, Texas Department of Transportation employees. I was a head coach at a private school, had over 100 student athletes on, my, on the team. I was leading chair workouts for people with Parkinson's disease. I brought 300 pairs of shoes to children in, in Haiti. I was traveling the world, going to India to learn yoga, going to Chile and Peru, got my master's degree in business administration, ended up uh, passing all four parts of the CPA exam. From the outside looking in, I was doing everything that you were supposed to do, right? Uh, I had an internship at Ernst & Young. Less than 1% of people 
get accepted to work at Ernst & Young, one of the big four public accounting firms. So again, from the outside looking in, it's like, hey, you're killing it. But on the inside, I just didn't feel peace at all. I just, I, and I didn't like myself. I was bitter. I was resentful. I wasn't forgiving people. I was impatient, quick to anger. If, if things didn't go exactly how I wanted, I would just kind of blow up. Not necessarily at people, but I would just blow up in my room, throw things in my room. But I also had a kind side, like I was saying, really high highs and really low lows. I would love on people. I would volunteer all the time. And I felt, I felt that love and I felt that peace, but I didn't feel, and I felt patience, but I didn't feel it on a regular basis. It was like I felt it for moments and then boom, felt explosive. And then fast forward, COVID hit and looking back, I wasn't a follower of Christ still. I believed in God, but I was just super angry, felt super empty. So then when COVID hit, I had three degrees but I wasn't considered essential at my job because I was working at a physical therapy clinic, working with people on their fitness. So I lost my job. Then my most serious girlfriend at the time broke up with me, ended up getting engaged to someone else. Less than six months later, married to someone else. My car got totaled. Lots of family and friends were having suicidal ideation. And I couldn't run because my Achilles and my ankles were so locked up from stress. And so all of these false idols were stripped from me. And I was there and I was just searching for answers. And I was like, man, I feel like I did everything you're supposed to do. How did I end up here? I wasn't suicidal or anything, but I wasn't in a good spot. And I was watching Jordan Peterson's Genesis lectures and the way that Jordan Peterson presents scripture to me resonates with the, the way my mind works. I have three college degrees, a degree in exercise science, master's degree in business administration, and an accounting degree, pass the CPA exam. I, I have taken courses at Harvard Business School, have high honors, Harvard Business School online, to, got high honors in those classes, so top 5% of the class, over 20 different fitness certifications. I love to study and I love to, to read. But what I realized was I didn't understand theology and I didn't understand philosophy because it's a different way of thinking that I was never taught. You go to school your whole life and you're taught to think a certain way, but I was never taught to think how a theologian thinks. And so what Jordan did is he took these complicated subjects of theology and philosophy, and he put them in terms that I was taught how to think. And, and what really resonated with me, what Jordan said, is he said that these stories are weird. They're complicated. So first he humbled himself. I had never heard anyone in an authority position talking about theology personally humble themselves first and foremost. Jordan Peterson was a, was a professor at the University of Toronto, tenured, Harvard professor, whether you agree with his worldviews or not, you can't argue that the guy is intelligent. And so what he said was these stories are complicated, but they've been around for thousands of years, and they won't go away. And so these stories have resonated with people for thousands of years across all different types of cultures and worldviews. Why is that? What is it about these stories, whether they're real or not real? There's something about these stories that resonates with the human condition that won't go away. And so I was like, dang, that's a good way of putting it. And so I started watching his lectures and I started reading Maps of Meaning, his first book, which is a very, very difficult read. But pretty much what he's saying is how do we architect and how do we build belief systems and value systems and why are, do we take them so seriously that we're willing to die for them? We're willing to go to war for belief systems to keep them. And pretty much he's saying in a world of infinite information, we're finite information processing machines. 
And so in a world of infinite information, we have to navigate this information. And when before you navigate it, it's chaos and it's potential. But through navigating it and through truth, you start to construct order. And so you want the perfect balance of being able to take chaos and create order. If you have too much chaos, you have a lack of meaning and you have a lack of purpose and you have nihilism. If you have too much order, there's too much restriction. You don't have enough creativity. You don't have enough artistic view. You don't have enough of the beautiful because too much order restricts the creativity and the artistic and the beauty of life. And so it's by writing the middle, the perfect balance between the chaos of the information and the order of the information, the creativity and the beauty and the rationale to construct higher levels of truth, that is what allows us to navigate life and its inevitable pain and its inevitable sufferings. And the last few pages of the book of Maps of Meaning is it says that Jesus is the perfect archetype or the best archetype that we have found to date to provide meaning and to provide purpose, to navigate the chaos and order of life, to produce the most fruit of the Spirit for people across people across time. That is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, love, self-control, and financial prosperity across people across time because of trying to embody the archetype of Jesus. And I did not know that when I picked up the book Maps of Meaning. And so that made me really think. And then at the time, I was working with a friend, still my friend, and we read Purpose Driven Life together, and she would have the conversations with me. She would humble herself and stay patient with me as I explored truth. And then I realized when I was volunteering, because I I just love to serve, I love to volunteer. I've always had a servant heart. Both my parents are career military. Both of them have servant hearts, and they instilled it in me. Every time I would volunteer, most of the other people would go to church. And so I started to reflect on all these different things being put in front of me. And I said, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And I went to a non-denominational church. And the pastor on stage, he humbled himself. He said, hey, this is just one of my gifts. I struggle with all of this stuff too. I'm not perfect. This is just what I think. This is what God has laid on my heart. And that really resonated with me. And, and so I just, again, I don't, I don't do anything part way. I don't do anything halfway, but I go all in. And so I, I started going to courses. I started going to classes at the church. I started asking questions and people would be patient with me and they would answer them and they would humble themselves and they weren't afraid to say, I don't know. And I think that's what's important is not being afraid of saying, I don't know. And so that leads to, to, well, how do we construct truth? Part of it is our rationale. Part of it is our emotion. Part of it is our experience. Well, how do, because for example, how do I know Abe Lincoln was real? I don't. I trust authority and I trust that authority because based on my own rationale, emotion, and experience, by me trusting that authority it has led to a higher quality of life spread by lower heart rate, higher financial abundance, higher, more friends, etc. right? And so the more I dove into church, the more I practiced worship, the more I prayed, the more I read the word, the more even keeled I was, the less anger I felt, the less bitterness I felt, the more forgiveness I felt, the more peace I felt, the more patience I felt. The highs weren't quite as high, but the lows weren't quite as low. And you feel a release in tension. And it's not easy at first because what you do when you start to follow Christ is you say that I'm going to shine a light on everything I hate about myself. Everything that I've been stuffing deep down all the monsters I didn't want to face, all the darkness I didn't want to shine a light on because I didn't feel strong enough because I was scared of the dark. What you do when you choose to follow Christ is you say, I'm following the light. And darkness can't exist where light is. And so you start to shine a light on a lot of things that 
that you suppressed. And I had to. And it wasn't easy. And it was really painful. And I cried a lot. A lot of things that I didn't like about myself, a lot of feelings of unworthiness, anxiety, a lot of habits that I didn't know why I did had to be broken down. And by following Christ and worshiping and getting into word and prayer and going to church and serving other people and practicing forgiveness of myself and others and repenting and giving it to God and knowing that I'm going to fall short of the glory of God. But that's why he had to sacrifice Jesus, his son, for me, ultimate grace, because we're always going to fall short. But God wanted to have a relationship with us, an intimate relationship with us. And the thing was, is I didn't love myself deep down. So how could I love God? And so God and Jesus helped me to love myself a little bit more, to be a little bit more patient with myself. And that overflowed to other people. And so I started to feel the peace and the patience. And I decided to get baptized on August 22nd, August, sorry, August 28th, 2022. And then the next year was the hardest year of my life. Going back to what I just said, car was totaled again. So this is again, right? COVID again. This is like 2022 now. Car was totaled, got fired from my job, knew I didn't want to go back into public accounting, knew I didn't want to just move to Phoenix and take a six-figure job and just go back into public accounting. My relationships with girls were breaking down again. Again, family and friends, suicidal ideation start popping up again. Injured again, can't run again. But this time, so I couldn't get a job and start working at Domino's. I have three degrees. I've turned down Ernst & Young. I'm turning down six-figure jobs daily. I'm crying daily. But there was enough little bit of light. During this same season of my life, I started a men's group. I started the year of pursuit. I joined the school of ministry to get my pastoral license. And I refused to quit. At Domino's, I would have conversations about God and Jesus with people every single day. Whether it was co-workers or people I was delivering pizzas to. And I felt bitterness being stripped out of me. I felt peace and patience being poured into me. I felt God ripping the roots of who I was to make room for to become all I possibly could be. And I stayed obedient and I stayed faithful. I ended up passing all four parts of the CPA exam, but I can't call myself a CPA because my former boss refused to sign my CPA license and then threatened to sue me with a cease and desist once I started my own accounting firm up in Flagstaff. I turned the other cheek. The cease and desist has no basis. I've talked to multiple lawyers. All it could do is cost me financial resources. But I decided to wave the white flag and go serve and deliver pizzas at Domino's. And then I got a phone call from my old boss at Run Lab, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I don't really know, to be honest with you, but I'm following Christ. And she said, do you want to come down to Phoenix and try to expand the vision that we've always talked about? And I said, yeah, let's do it. So I took the plunge. I moved down to Phoenix without knowing a single person. And within that first week, the members of the gym that I landed at celebrated my birthday. One of the members, I'm living in his guest house, one of the nicest people I've ever met. He is an atheist, but at the same time, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to me, to be honest with you. We, we're literally 99% the same in terms of kindness and how we go about living our lives. I just believe that there's a divine transcendent spirit. He doesn't necessarily want to call it that. Landed here. Didn't know. I came here without a place to live. I was living literally in a crack motel the first week I was here, charging a credit card. I didn't know. And this guy, I'm the first person he's ever rented to. Landed at a church. Have made tons of friends down here. 
and just continues to grow and continue to get at the fruit of the Spirit. And so from this, I understand what it's done for my life, and I think that my approach will be different. I don't believe that everybody needs to read the Bible necessarily, and I don't believe that everyone needs to go into a physical church. I believe that we have the Word written on our hearts, as it says in Scripture. I believe that it's written in our conscience, and I believe that we can have intimate relationship with God, and I believe that we can have fellowship because where two or more are gathered, God's presence is there, and by definition, God's presence is the church, and we are the church in that regards. So as long as you're having constructive conversations, as long as you're wrestling with your conscience and what it tells you to do and not do, I believe that is the essence of being a Christian personally and serving others and loving others and trying your best to love yourself as well. And so that's my testimony, and I hope that it provided some values, provided some insight, changed your perception, changed your perspective, and I look forward to, to diving deeper on this journey with y'all. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless.